Hi, this is Rob Penzek with Road to Reason. And as many of our viewers know, Richard Dawkins was kind enough to be our guest on a past show. That same day, Professor Dawkins also gave a talk at George Washington University, which Road to Reason has exclusive footage of and is now proud to bring to you. Our great thanks goes out to Elizabeth Cornwell, co-host of this show and counselor for the Richard Dawkins Foundation, who made this episode possible. And here I thought no one knew who I was. <laughs> My name's Richard Haynes, or the other Richard as I've been known the past couple days. Uh, a lot of people don't know me unless I use my internet name, which is Brother Richard, which is a joke name that went totally out of control. Um, it's my honor to introduce two wonderful people here tonight, and I'll get quick to it because that's why you're here. Uh, first, very good friend of mine, Jamila Bay. If you don't know, she's a journalist here in D.C., and she run, uh, hosts the radio show Sex, Politics, and Religion Hour. Well, that's all the things not controversial, so that must be really good. <laughs> she's also the founding member of the National Science and Technology, did I say that right? National Science and Technology News Service. So she's great, she's a speaker, she's a writer, and like I said, a good friend of mine. This other gentleman here is the person who really does need no introduction, as all of you know. Uh, it's pretty bad when you, the introducer needs more of an introduction. Uh, we all know that he worked at Oxford, was, uh, was a great scientist, has written many great, wonderful books. Uh, the Selfish Gene, The Blind Watchmaker, Unveiling the Rainbow, The Devil's, a Devil's Chaplain, all great reads. Those are just a few of them. But even before him becoming an author, he, he lived a pretty extraordinary life growing up in Africa, to, uh, to be an assistant pre uh, professor at the University of California, Berkeley, from the years of 1967 to 1969, which is probably a book within itself, I would imagine. Um, one of the things with all these books and, and the, the great things that came out, uh, I should let you know a little bit about myself. In the year 2006, uh, I was a preacher at one time, an associate minister in a, one of the country's first megachurches. And I had left the church. I had uh, determined, for all intents and purposes, that I knew that the God that I was taught to believe wasn't real. He probably didn't exist. But I wouldn't use that word, atheist. He, they scared me. Uh, they're always the evil communists, and, and uh, they eat babies, and all these things that we heard. So I was very scared. But uh, I was with my family. I was the first person in my family to become a Christian. I led them all to Jesus, and now I'm the outcast, of course. <laughs> but it was in 2006, my family was with us. Uh, we were, went out to eat in a restaurant, and we went to a Barnes & Noble afterwards. And I, I came across this book, this exact copy of this book, actually, The God Delusion. I saw it with its shiny cover, and I you know, was very interested in it because I love truth and science, and I was still looking for... Uh, reality, wanted to know what reality was. And so I, uh, when the family got in the car, I actually snuck back in to buy a copy and I hid it. And I uh, went home, hid it underneath my bed, and I would get it out each night, read a little bit of it. And it scared the hell out of me, literally. Or the opposite, depending on your uh, perspective. <laughs> but needless to say, by the time I was done with it, I, I realized and acknowledged that I too was an atheist and that it was a word that I should embrace. And it's a, a, something that I should uh, take up as my mantle, so to speak, a, a, almost like the Protestant Reformation. It's, it's a shame we even have to use a word like atheist, but like the Protestants did, you know, our, our, our society forces us to answer that God question. But even more than that, uh, and, and, and the book in the God Delusion was written in such a way where he ignored that whole non-overlapping magisterium, all, all, this, all these things. He really was able to, to talk to me in, in, a, uh, in a real way. Um, but all that and all the things we hear about Professor Dawkins, that's just one side of his life. Uh, the other night, Friday night, and this is the last thing I'll say, I was able to eat dinner with him at a couple's uh, friend of ours' house. And we were outside, they were grilling some steaks, and he started walking around in the bushes and, and you know, doing things, and we 
what's he doing over there? And he had heard a cricket, and he was looking for this cricket, and he wanted to find the cricket. And he was just obsessed with the cricket. And I thought, wow, that's what I would have done when I was eight years old, and now I'm trying to act mature. But that wonder is what makes a scientist. That wonder is what your children have. That wonder, that desire for, for what is there that's more, that appetite for wonder. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Dawkins. Good evening, one and all, and thank you so much for being here. Um, Dr. Dawkins, that was a perfect segue. It completely took away my first line, the cricket. <laughs> yes. um, well, I, I gathered that, uh, that Brother Richard was telling the story of the cricket last night. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason I was so fascinated is that um, human ears, mam mammalian ears, uh, can tell the direction the sound is coming from only by comparing the left ear with the right ear. And that's because uh, vertebrate ears are barometers. They detect pressure differences. Whereas insect ears um, are kind of weather vanes. They have little hairs that actually vibrate uh, in the direction of plane of the, of the sound waves that are coming. So in order to be difficult to hear the direction, a male cricket, uh, if the male cricket wants to be heard by a female cricket, but does not want to be heard by a vertebrate predator, he does a very special kind of sound, which is difficult to locate with barometer ears, but easy to locate with weather vane ears. And I was desperately trying to find this cricket, and every time I wandered around, um, it would seem to move to a different place. It wasn't moving. It was actually staying in the same place, but it created the illusion of being in a different place. Sorry, I stole your thunder. As well. no, that, that's fascinating. <laughs> that's, that's so wonderful. Um, now, this is a conversation with Dr. Dawkins this evening, but before we get into the back and forth and the questions that I've got, uh, Doctor, would you give us a reading? You, yeah, you want to yeah. read a few passages, and uh, we'll begin after that. Um, I'm going to read um, three, possibly four, short passages from the book. Um, the first one is a sort of lighter touch. It's the, it's the beginning pages, and it's about my uh, ancestry where my genes came from, I suppose. Glad to know you, Clint. The friendly passport controller was not to know that British people are sometimes given a family name first, followed by the name their parents wanted them to use. I was always to be Richard, just as my father was always John. Our first name of Clinton was something we forgot about, as our parents had intended. To me, it has been no more than a niggling irritation which I would have been happier without, notwithstanding the serendipitous realization that it gives me the same initials as Charles Robert Darwin. But alas, nobody anticipated the United States Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> Not content with scanning our shoes and rationing our toothpaste, they decreed that anyone entering America must travel under his first name exactly as written in his passport. So I had to forego my lifelong identity as Richard and rebrand myself Clinton R. Dawkins when booking tickets to the States, and of course, when filling in those important forms, the ones that require you explicitly to deny that you're entering the USA in order to overthrow the Constitution by force of arms. <laughs> Sole purpose of visit was the British broadcaster Gilbert Harding's response to that. Nowadays, such levity will see you banged up. Clinton Richard Dawkins, then, is the name on my birth certificate and passport, and my father was Clinton John. As it happened, he was not the only C. Dawkins whose name appeared in the Times as the father of a boy born in the Escatine nursing home, Nairobi, in March 1941. The other was the Reverend Cuthbert Dawkins, Anglican missionary and no relation. My bemused mother received a shower of congratulations from bishops and clerics in England, unknown to her, but kindly calling down God's blessings upon her newborn son. We cannot know whether the misdirected benedictions intended for Cuthbert's son had any improving effect on me, but he became a missionary like his father, and I became a biologist like mine. To this day, my mother jokes that I might be the wrong one. 
I'm happy to say that more than just my physical resemblance to my father reassures me that I'm not a changeling and was never destined for the church. Clinton first became a Dawkins family name when my great-great-great-great-grandfather, Henry Dawkins, 1765 to 1852, married Augusta, daughter of General Sir Henry Clinton, who, as Commander-in-Chief of British forces from 1778 to 1782, was partly responsible for losing the American War of Independence. <laughs> the circumstances of the marriage make the commandeering of his name by the Dawkins family seem a bit cheeky. The following extract is from History of Great Portland Street, where General Clinton lived. In 1788, his daughter eloped from the street in a hackney coach with Mr. Dawkins, who eluded pursuit by posting half a dozen other hackney coaches at the corners of the street leading into Portland Place with directions to drive off as rapidly as possible, each in a different direction. I wish I could claim this ornament of the family escutcheon as the inspiration for Stephen Leacock's Lord Ronald, who flung himself upon his horse and rode madly off in all directions. I'd also like to think that I inherited some of Henry Dawkins' resourcefulness, not to mention his ardour. This is unlikely, however, as only one thirty-second part of my genome is derived from him. One sixty-fourth part is from General Clinton himself, and I've never shown any military leanings. Tests of the D'Urbervilles and the Hound of the Baskervilles are not the only works of fiction that invoke hereditary throwbacks to distant ancestors, forgetting that the proportion of genes shared is halved with every generation and therefore dies away exponentially. Henry and Augustus' son, Clinton George Augustus Dawkins, 1808 to 71, was one of the few Dawkinses actually to use the name Clinton. If he inherited any of his father's ardor, he nearly lost it in 1849 during an Austrian bombardment of Venice, where he was the British consul. I have a cannonball in my possession, sitting on a plinth bearing an inscription on a brass plate. I don't know whose is the authorial voice, and I don't know how reliable it is, but for what it's worth, here is my translation from French, then the language of diplomacy. One night, when he was in bed, a cannonball penetrated the bed covers and passed between his legs, but happily did him no more than superficial damage. This narrow escape of my ancestor's vital parts <laughs> took place before he was to put them to use. <laughs> and it is tempting to attribute my own existence to a stroke of ballistic luck. A few inches closer to the fork of Shakespeare's radish and... <laughs> but actually, my existence and yours and the postman's hangs from a far narrower thread of luck than that. We owe it to the precise timing and placing of everything that ever happened since the universe began. The incident of the cannonball is only a dramatic example of a much more general phenomenon. As I put it before, if the second dinosaur to the left of the tall cycad tree had not happened to sneeze and thereby failed to catch the tiny shrew-like ancestor of all the mammals, we would none of us be here. We all can regard ourselves as exquisitely improbable. But here, in a triumph of hindsight, we are. CGA Cannonball, Dawkins' son, Clinton, later Sir Clinton, Edward Dawkins, 1859 to 1905, was one of many Dawkinses to attend Balliol College, Oxford, as I was later to do. He was there at the right time to be immortalized in the Balliol Rhymes. In the spring term of 1881, seven undergraduates composed and printed scurrilous rhymes about personalities of the college. Most famous is the verse that celebrates Balliol's great master, Benjamin Jowett, composed by H.C. Beeching, later Dean of Norwich Cathedral. First come I, my name is Jowett. There's no knowledge, but I know it. I am master of this college. What I don't know isn't knowledge. Less witty, but intriguing to me, is the rhyme on Clinton Edward Dawkins. Positivists ever talk in such an epic style as Dawkins. God is naught and man is all. Spell him with a capital. 
Free thinkers were much less common in Victorian times, and I wish I had met great, great Uncle Clinton. And what should we make of that epic style? I'm now going to read another short passage um, about my time at boarding school. Moments of acute embarrassment linger in memory and wring an audible groan out of me when I recall them. At Chaffin Grove School, we had a sit-down tea every day where we ate bread and butter. While we were lining up to file into the dining room, the duty master would sometimes read out a list of names supplied by a boy whose birthday it was. The named invitees would drop out of the line and go to a special table set out for birthdays at the end of the dining hall, laden with birthday cake, jellies, and other good things, sent by the loving mother. I understood the principle, and I understood about supplying the duty master with the list of your friends' names. That was very clear. What slipped my attention was the small point that you had to arrange for your mother in advance to send the cake and jelly. On my birthday, perhaps my ninth, I wrote out the list of my friends and gave it to the duty master, who read it aloud. My chosen friends walked eagerly into the dining room, surveyed the empty table, and even after all these years, embarrassment prevents me from describing the scene any further. <laughs> what still baffles me is why it never occurred to me to wonder where the cake was supposed to come from. Perhaps I vaguely thought the school cook would provide it. <laughs> But even so, shouldn't I have wondered how the cook was supposed to know it was my birthday? Perhaps I thought it materialized by supernatural magic, like sixpenny bits when you put a tooth under your pillow. I was an exceptionally untidy and disorganized little boy in my early years at Chaffin Grove School. My first school reports dwelt insistently on the theme of ink. Headmaster's report. He has produced some good work and well deserves his prize. A very inky little boy at present, which is apt to spoil his work. Mathematics. He works very well, but I'm not always able to read his work. He must learn that ink is for writing, not washing purposes. <laughs> Latin. He has made steady progress, but unfortunately, when using ink, his written work becomes very untidy. Miss Benson, my elderly French teacher, somehow managed to omit the ink-like motif, but even her report had a sting in the tail. French. Plenty of ability, a good pronunciation, and a wonderful facility in escaping work. <laughs> ink. Well, what do you expect if you equip every desk with an open inkwell and give the children dip pens that might have been designed to flick ink all over the room? I now want to turn to a more serious passage, and we need the, the slide if we could. Thank you, yes. Um, my supervisor at Oxford when I did my doctoral research was the great Nico Tinbergen, who later went on to win a Nobel Prize. But actually, my closer mentor was his deputy, Dr. Michael Cullen, and I want to read this tribute to him, which I actually composed as a eulogy for him in his memorial service. He did not publish many papers himself, yet he worked prodigiously hard, both in teaching and research. He was probably the most sought-after tutor in the entire zoology department. The rest of his time, he was always in a hurry and worked a hugely long day, was devoted to research. But seldom his own research. Everybody who knew him has the same story to tell. All the obituaries told it in revealingly similar terms you would have a problem with your research. You knew exactly where to go for help, and there he would be for you. I see the scene as yesterday, the lunchtime conversation in the crowded little kitchen, the wiry boyish figure in the red sweater, slightly hunched like a spring wound up with intense intellectual energy, sometimes rocking back and forth with concentration. The deeply intelligent eyes understanding what you meant even before the words came out the back of the envelope to aid explanation, the occasional skeptical, quizzical tilt of the eyebrows under the untidy hair. Then he would have to rush off. He always rushed everywhere, perhaps for a tutorial, and he would seize his biscuit tin by its wire handles and disappear. 
but next morning the answer to your problem would arrive in Mike's small distinctive handwriting. Two pages, often some algebra, diagrams, a key reference to the literature, sometimes an apt verse of his own composition, or a fragment of Latin or classical Greek. Always encouragement. We were grateful, but not grateful enough. If we'd thought about it, we would have realized he must have been working on that mathematical model of my research all evening. And it isn't only me for whom he does this. Everybody in the group gets the same treatment, and not just his own students. I was officially Nico Tinbergen's student, not Mike's. Mike took me on without payment and without official recognition when my research became more mathematical than Nico could handle. When the time came for me to write my thesis, it was Mike Cullen who read it, criticized it, helped me polish every line, and all this while he was doing the same thing for his own official students. When, we all should have wondered, does he get time for ordinary family life? When does he get time for his own research? No wonder he so seldom published everything, anything. No wonder he never wrote his long-awaited book on animal communication. In truth, he should have been joint author of just about every one of the hundreds of papers that came out of that group during that golden period. In fact, his name appears on virtually none of them, except in the acknowledgments section. The worldly success of scientists is judged for promotion or honors by their published papers. Mike did not rate highly on this index. But if he had consented to add his name to his students' publications as readily as modern supervisors insist on putting their names on papers to which they contribute much less, Mike would have been a conventionally successful scientist, lauded with conventional honors. As it is, he was a brilliantly successful scientist in a far deeper and truer sense. And I think we know which kind of scientist we really admire. Oxford sadly lost him to Australia. Years later, in Melbourne, at a party for me as a visiting lecturer, I was standing, probably rather stiffly, with a drink in my hand. Suddenly, a familiar figure shot into the room in a hurry as ever. The rest of us were in suits, but not this familiar figure. The years vanished away. Everything was the same. Though he must have been well into his sixties, he still seemed to be in his thirties. The glow of boyish enthusiasm even the red sweater. Next day, he drove me to the coast to see his beloved penguins, stopping on the way to look at giant Australian earthworms, many feet long. We tired the sun with talking, not, I think, about old times and old friends, and certainly not about ambition, grant-getting, and papers in nature, but about new science and new ideas. It was a perfect day, the last day I saw him. We may know other scientists as intelligent as Mike Cullen, though not many. We may know other scientists who were as generous in support, though vanishingly few. But I declare we have known nobody who had so much to give, combined with so much generosity in giving it. What a wonderful tribute, Dr. Dawkins. That, that's, that's just beautiful to, to remember one who helped to shape and form you. Um, and and uh, though we don't have a scientific language of diplomacy, and I'm going to bring that cricket up again, though we have those in power who have ears that maybe hear but don't always listen, it's essential to drive forward this species that we are. We have to continue to wonder and train up the minds that will help to find the answers to the questions that we pose today. Um, how wonderful that, that you have had that and, and you, you write about him. In this modern era, uh, particularly in this country, we have a bit of a disconnect between the reality that is science and those who have the reality of power up on Capitol Hill. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, that's so. Um, I would love your thoughts about what we need to be thinking about, what we who understand science and love science and know what science can do for us can do 
to help and spread that message and help to use that language, perhaps, of scientific diplomacy that doesn't yet exist. There's not the slightest doubt that this country is the world's leading scientific nation by far. Uh, and I had a beautiful example of it, I think, yesterday when I visited Janelia Farms um, Research Institute uh, outside Washington. I mean, a most astonishing place, an astounding powerhouse of advanced scientific research and the technology needed to do scientific research. And I was deeply moved to see this, this amazingly progressive scientific place. And I felt this is such a great scientific nation, and yet you achieve this in spite of being dragged backwards by nearly half the population who, well, just as a, as a symptom, think that the, that the world is less than 10,000 years old. Uh, just think what you could do if you didn't have that incubus on your back. <laughs> <laughs> So one thing we can do, I suppose, is to try to uh, educate th this, this benighted near majority, 44%, um, I think it is at the moment, who think the world is less than 10,000 years old. We can attempt to educate them, uh, and uh, a, a lot is being done, but I suppose more, more could be done. But I think also um, we can make science exciting of course, it is exciting. I mean, the, I think there are two main approaches to the selling of science to, to a public audience. One is what I call the non-stick frying pan approach, which is to say science is useful and you see its usefulness wherever you look. Uh, the non-stick frying pan is a byproduct of the science that went into the space race. Um, that's not my way. That's the way that says science is useful. We should be supporting science because it's useful. I think that's rather like saying uh, the, the advantage of music is that it's good exercise for the violinist's right arm. <laughs> music is beautiful. Music moves you to tears. Science is beautiful. Science can move you to tears. When you look up at the Milky Way, when, when, I, when I visit a giant telescope, a big reflecting telescope uh, like the ones in the Canary Islands or on the mountaintop in Hawaii. Um, when I visited the CERN uh, nuclear, nuclear research, research center in Geneva, near, near Geneva, again, moved to tears by this gigantic human enterprise, this, this cooperative feat of, of thousands of people all pulling together to, to do great research. Science is wonderful. You get this from Carl Sagan and the, uh, the Cosmos um, series, which I believe is being remade, and it is, sounds yeah. absolutely excellent, um, with Neil deGrasse Tyson. And what, a, what an, an excellent project. Okay. I think that sort of science, and on the biological side, um, things like David Attenborough's natural history uh, programs, uh, which, which make science seem wonderful. It's useful as well, of course it is useful, but that's not the point of it. The point of it is that it's wonderful. It's, it's a great part of our culture. By the way, is it true that David Attenborough's programs have been marketed in this country with his voice dubbed over by somebody else? I'm, I'm shocked. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well never mind about that. We'll, we'll draw a veil over that. They are wonderful programs nevertheless, and the Discovery Channel has wonderful uh, programs as well. So I think the wonder of science, I would call my book the appetite, An Appetite for Wonder, the, the wonder of science, not just the spectacle that these great um, television and films can show you, but also the reflection that evolution by natural selection has taken atoms which just bumble around in following the, the laws of physics, has taken them and channeled them in this remarkably sophisticated way, I think that's the word for it, natural selection giving rise to eons of evolution, giving rise to the whole of the vertebrates, to the mammals, to the primates, to us, with, our, with a brain, we have an evolved brain, evolved by natural selection, 
which is capable of understanding the process that got us here. Now, isn't that a thrilling thought? That we are nothing but physics, we're nothing but atoms bumping against each other. And yet, this process of Darwinian natural selection has channeled these physical processes to make a brain which is capable over many centuries, actually, of, of, of historical development of science, is capable of understanding and reconstructing the process that's given rise to the universe, that's given rise to life, that's given rise to, to us. How could anybody not want to spend their life studying that? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a fascinating, a fascinating way to put it. Yet, here in the US, that's exactly what we're up against. Um, our, all of our innovation, all of our development, the fact that we, we give to our teenagers in their pockets more powerful computers than sent men and women to the moon, um, it, it, it's fascinating. We, we have to have these conversations. But while I have you here to have this one, when we consider that right now in in Kansas, uh, in a lot of places around the country, but there's a lawsuit in Kansas against the school board and a number of other named entities to actively ensure that that very story, the story of evolved human existence, is kept out of the schools, is kept away from the children. Um, I got to go to the International Creation Science Convention this past summer. I, it was hard, but I went. Um, <laughs> It was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I'm from. Um, there are panels, yes, Pittsburgh, very well. Um, there are panels how to keep your children away from evolution. You know, how to make sure that Darwinists don't get a hold of your child. This, this, is, what, this is what we're up against, and we are losing the ability to know ourselves in advance. Yes. They can't be very secure, can they, if they're desperately trying to keep their children yeah. away from uh, <laughs> education. It is an outrage um, that there are people with real power, political power, in this country and legal muscle um, who want to replace the scientific wisdom of centuries, actually, now, um, by and the, the, in, the scientific wisdom of just about every knowledgeable scientist in the world with the writings of an illiterate bunch of desert camel herders. The title of your book, of course, is An Appetite for Wonder, The Making of a Scientist. And there was a time here in the US where we focused on that. Um, predates me just a little, but you know, when, when we were in the space race, when Americans were told by their president, um, we will see a man on the moon, we will advance this nation and the knowledge therein. Uh, and it was a priority of every American to take part we saw wonderful things happen. Now, uh, I, I too am very excited about the upcoming Cosmos. It'll be put on by, uh, again, you mentioned Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, the, the producer of that is Seth MacFarlane, who is best known as a, an animator and comedian. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, but, but he's, he's doing the good work. Um, what needs to happen so that we can continue this work? We need another scientific renaissance in this country, in the world, and I wonder how we might make that happen. I am old enough to remember um, Sputnik and, and the consequent um, revival, I mean, awakening of American um, worry about, about science and the consequent renaissance that you, that you described. Uh, and um, like most of the world, I suppose, I, I was watching telev on television when Neil Armstrong uh, stepped onto the moon. And I was privileged to meet Neil Armstrong shortly before he died, and, and what a wonderful man he was. Um, 
I, you're telling me that, that that spirit has died away since then. I mean, I don't live here, so I, I did live there then. I, I was living in America at the time. Well, the major political will, the, the president, President Kennedy put that out as a major initiative. Um, there weren't school boards fighting at every turn to dumb down the curriculum. We, we look to the great state of Louisiana where you know, the governor is suing the attorney general of this country about um, vouchers for religious schools, which we know is about science education. Um, there is a concerted effort today to undermine the values that will promote science and promote the development of greater learning yes. in this country. So that individual families, of course, are always going to love science. And here in Washington, where we have the greatest, I would argue, my, my friend, the greatest museums in the world, we can, you know, have a drink and debate that a bit, but um, there is a political will today that has never existed before to dumb down yeah. and to eliminate, even eliminate the funding for yes. the development. Yes. And we certainly are not developing in this country the, the scientific minds that are already here. And, and that's worrisome, particularly to one such as myself who has a small child who, every small child's a scientist. Let me ask whether there are two things going on here. I, I suspect that there's one thing is the special case of evolution, because that is thought to specifically contradict the book of Genesis. But the other thing might be a fear of intellectualism, generally. Um, a, a, and I think you see it when, when people vote for a candidate who is more or less being sold on being stupid. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I think of the, um, what would it have been, two, 2006 election, was there 2000? 2008 was a presidential two, 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 election. 2008 oh. presidential election, was that when? Um, Obama's first term. Obama's first, no, no, I'm thinking of the one between Kerry and Bush. Okay, that, that was 2004. 2004 um, where Quite clearly, K Kerry was just thought to be too clever. Um, and they had debates together, and I watched the, deba the debates together, and, and clearly one man was intelligent and fit to be president, and the other was an idiot. <laughs> um, and, and my, 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 my sense was that, that B B Bush was elected not, not in spite of being stupid, but because he was stupid. Um, it, it could, is it possible that people want to, want to elect a president who's the kind of person who's like me? I want to have a beer with him. Have a beer with him. Uh, um, that, that great populism that, that has long permeated we, And it's a, an astonishing thing when you think about, I mean, the point's been made many times, but when you, when you board an airliner, you want the best pilot you can get. You don't want somebody like me. Um, <laughs> When you're going to have an operation, you want the best surgeon you can get. You don't want somebody like me. But when it comes to the most important job in the world, President of the United States, you don't want somebody who's qualified to do it. <laughs> it Touche. <laughs> um, is it possible that that's the second thing that's going on in the dumbing down that you're talking about? The, the there is absolutely a, a, a strong streak of anti-intellectualism that's gone through this country, and I, I do believe that there is quite a bit of that at play. Um, but you do hit the nail on the head when you say that evolution, or uh, as, as it's called, um, Evil, evil, E V I L, Lucian. Yes, yes. Yeah, there are many posters that I have pictures of at that convention. They the, call English, it the English pronunciation is rather unfortunate. For yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the, the funny, th it, it's not funny. The, the sad thing is that um, I, I do believe you're right. The contradiction of the book of Genesis is uh, deeply frightening to a number of Americans and to those who are elected to serve, all Americans, even those who don't hold the same religious bent. It's important to say, state, of course, that, that not all Christians wish to take the book of Genesis literally, and, and it would be deeply offensive to many vicars and bishops and archbishops and people to suggest that they are uh, in the same camp as these fundamentalists. I mean, I've, in, in Britain, I've worked together with bishops 
um, uh, I, I, I collaborated with the Bishop of Oxford, uh, and together we, we rounded up, I think, half a dozen bishops and half a dozen fellows of the Royal Society, which is the equivalent to the National Academy of Sciences here, um, to write a joint letter to the Prime Minister protesting about creationism being taught in, in, in schools. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't uh, take any notice of us. Mm. That's sad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, similar here to the US, uh, we, we've got a problem and we've, we've got to continue to fight on it. Um, well, it's, it's arguable that people like me who sound too in your face are not the right people to do it. Um, hmm. some, some people have suggested that it's better to be more seductive than I am. Ah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, more, and less um, in your face. Mm -hmm. I get called aggressive about that all the time. Yeah. Well, I think maybe there's a room for both, both ways. And, well, we, the, the world does need its diplomats. Yeah. So scientific diplomacy, we, we need a language, yes. we need people to go forth and be it, ambassadors. This is a much more diplomatic book. It's yeah. much more um, <laughs> That's exactly much the point. Much more gentle I'll, book. Yes. You, you, my friend, you keep taking my lines. So <laughs> um, Dr. Dawkins, your book, however, is not the firebrand style. It is, it is far more diplomatic. Um, you, you read my notes, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> This is, this is a wonderful way of, of putting forth that argument and, and your own story. Um, Thank you. I would love it if you would talk just a little bit about um, the moment where you realized that you had no other choice but to be a scientist. That for you personally, when you knew that I'm going to give a, a little bit to the religious here. You were called to science. Yes. <laughs> I was called to science rather disgracefully late, actually. Um, it, it didn't come to me in childhood. I uh, kind of drifted into the scientific stream at school, pretty much just following my father, who was a real naturalist. And so um, when it came for time for me to apply to go to university, um, I naturally applied to read biological science. I, I actually applied to read biochemistry, uh, and they turned me down to read biochemistry, I think because the tutor who interviewed me was a biochemist would have had to have taught me himself. <laughs> um, but he did admit me to read zoology, and uh, that was the best thing that happened to me that so far, um, because it was ideally suited to me, and it was really at Oxford, really at university, in my second year at university, that I uh, received the call to science. And it was because, uh, in the, at least in zoology at Oxford, you were encouraged not to learn textbook facts. We didn't really have textbooks. You were encouraged to go into the library uh, with a reading list of original research papers and follow up the latest research literature on a particular, probably rather narrow subject, you've only got a week to do it in. So during that one week, you read up this particular subject, and by the end of the week, you wrote your essay on the subject, and you were, by then, a world authority on that subject, because nobody else had read it up so recently, or not many people had anyway. You certainly, if you were any good, you certainly knew more about it than your tutor, because he hadn't read it up so recently. And that was a wonderful experience for a 19-year-old. And I think it was really that that fired me up with science, and also the fact that the essays I was required to write were very much not regurgitating facts. They were um, on, often controversial subjects. You had to make a decision, you had to make a choice between different points of view. So you had to read up the, the latest literature. People, professional scientists who thought X and the professional scientists who thought the opposite of X and come to a decision yourself. So I got used to the idea of controversy. I got used to the idea of weighing up evidence on, on both sides. Uh, and I think there is something wonderful about uh, requiring a very young student to, to, to do that. And so it really wasn't until my second year at Oxford that I got what you could call the call. Uh -huh. And what, what did you want to know? Or was it just the love of learning 
uh, and, and the, the ability to produce trials on your own that, that made you want to continue? I think, it, I, think I was intrigued by the, very, by the sort of deep questions of existence, which I referred to before. You know, what, what's life all about? Where does it come from? Um, why, why, why are we here? How did it all start? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, your countryman, the uh, late, great Christopher Hitchens, often referred to religion as man's first attempt to know, uh, man's first attempt at philosophy and biology and whatnot. Um, and uh, you were a rather outspoken critic of what religion can do to the minds of young children. Um, and labeling them as a particular sect or another is not something that you are fond of at all. Um, I, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about how we can, understanding that, frankly, in this world we are outnumbered. More people believe that it's fine to train up a child in, in religion than not. But understanding yes. that, how do we help such children to embrace the fact that they are little scientists who want to know and want to wonder, yeah. um, despite it being actually told of them, you shouldn't think that way. Yes. I make a distinction between indoctrinating children, which is bad enough, and labeling them, which is worse. And you mentioned labeling. Um, and um, I, I, it's a particular bee in my bonnet, which maybe I'm getting a bit of a bore about, but I do think it's wicked to call a four-year-old child a Catholic child or a Muslim child. Uh, these children are too young to know what they think about the cosmos and, and about the human condition and about morality. Um, they are not Catholic children or Muslim children. They are children of Catholic parents, children of Muslim parents. And people immediately get the... <laughs> and any, anybody who doesn't get that, and, and many, many people don't, because they, you consistently hear people t talking about Catholic children, etc. You can immediately make them get the point by talking about an existentialist child a logical positivist child, a um, postmodernist child. <laughs> nobody would ever dream of doing that. Nobody, nobody would ever dream of fastening a label around a child's neck and writing on it the philosophical position of its parents. And yet we, most people have not the slightest hesitation in doing that with religion. And the consequence of that is that religion goes on and on and on and on because we all assume, and it actually turns out unfortunately to be true, that children do turn out to have the same religion as their parents. With honorable exceptions, most children do. That's why if you're born in Afghanistan, the chances are very high you'll be Muslim. And if you're born in Poland, the chances are very high that you'll be Catholic. And you know perfectly well if you're in Afghanistan, if you're born in Afghanistan, that if only you happened to have been born in Poland, you'd have been, you'd have been Catholic and vice versa. Everybody, everybody must know that. And yet somehow the message doesn't, they still think their own religion must be the, must be the true one. So labeling children, I think, is a grave sin. Um, indoctrination in one particular religion is is less of a sin, but it's still pretty bad. It's, a, it's terrible if, if it's something like indoctrinating them with the idea of punishment in hell for all eternity. Uh, that is very, very wicked indeed, because some children really believe it. Of course, it doesn't matter if you don't believe it, but if you do believe it, if you really believe that if you die a sinner, or unshriven, or whatever it is for your particular denomination, you are going to roast forever in hell and when your skin has been burned off, a new skin will grow again in order to be burned off. That is child abuse of a major psychological form. <laughs> Any kind of indoctrination in the form of you are a Catholic child, therefore you believe this, you are a Muslim child, therefore you believe that, is wrong. I do think that education about religion is important and a good thing. I would like to see children taught about religion. You need to know about religion, you need to know the existence of religion, or you can't understand much of history. Certainly much of European history is, most of the European wars in history have been about religion. 
You can't understand European history without understanding about the deep divides between Protestants and Catholics, between Christians and Muslims, and persecutions of the Jews. Um, so teaching about religion is important, but that's very, very different from uh, indoctrinating a child in one particular religion, which is wicked. We are at the point where we're about to open up for a question and answer. And um, so just before we do that, I would love to give you the opportunity to state what you will. I've, I've uh, gotten to ask you all of the questions I've had. I wonder if there's anything that uh, you, you wanted to uh, make a point of before we, we open up the floor. Hmm. Um, no, I think I'd rather just hear what, what people have to say, actually. Um, very I'll, well. I'll, I'll, I'll say lots of things in reply to them. And, and, so, and, lovely. So uh, Richard Haynes will come up and moderate the questions. Um, there are microphones. I can. I'm being. Can we have the house separate. lights up? Would that, yes. be, would that um, be possible? Can well, we, I'll just take the opportunity to uh, remind folks that questions are. We turn are down these lights a little bit. Uh, that so end see. in a who, what, when, where, why, how. Um, <laughs> Uh, so please keep them short. We do have a right. number of people who would There's like to There's three microphones. Uh, there should be someone standing by each one. Uh, make your questions short. We don't need statements. If you make statements, we will cut you off. Uh, people came to hear these two. So we'll start here in the middle. Um, in one of your TED Talks, you made the valid and equally horrifying statement that the highest position in the world is barred to those who are um, simultaneously truthful and um, intelligent, meaning <laughs> those that um, want to be president have to either be religious or not be and lie about it. How can we help politicians to come out of the closet as atheists? There are... Is it 535 members of the U.S. Congress? Yes. 535 Five, indeed, yes. 535, you're 535. right. 535. And every single one of them is a religious believer. Is that credible? Of course it's not credible. How could it be? These people, many of them, are actually quite educated. <laughs> A, a large number of them have simply got to be lying. And that's what I think the questioner meant by her quotation of um, uh, highest office is denied to those who are, what, right, something, what, what was it again, um, simultaneously? Um, intelligent. Is, 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 is and, uh, a, yes, honest uh, and intelligent. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, because if they, were, if they are intelligent and honest, they would say, I'm not a religious believer. They are being dishonest, and I can understand it, I, I don't blame them for it, because they think, honest, they honestly think, and they could be right, that they'll lose votes if they, uh, if they come out as an atheist or agnostic. Um, I think most of us think President Obama is probably an atheist. Um, I suspect that Presidents Clinton and Kennedy probably were as well, uh, although they, they professed uh, religions of, di of different kinds. They had to, or they wouldn't have been elected. What I actually wonder, though, is whether there's a bit of an emperor's new clothes effect going here. Could it be that everybody thinks that you cannot win an election unless you constantly say, uh, God bless America, and so on? Um, but actually, nobody's ever tried not saying it. <laughs> Maybe they're wrong. Maybe the nuns, that to say, the N-O-N-E's, not the N-U-N's, maybe the, maybe the nuns, they've already reached, I think, 22% of the American population. That's a very high percentage. And those are the people who actually admit to pollsters that they don't believe in any kind of God. There possibly are many more. Uh, there's poll evidence in Britain that people who call themselves Christian in censuses uh, actually, only about half of them, or actually less than half of them, really are Christians in any meaningful sense. My British foundation, Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science UK, ran an opinion poll in the week after the 2011 census, 
and we asked only the people who ticked the Christian box in the census, I, I advertised themselves as being Christian, we asked them a number of supplementary questions uh, in the very week of the census and showed that actually most of them are not Christians in any sense that you'd understand at all. And one of the questions we asked them was, why did you tick the Christian box? Was it because you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Was it because this? Was it because that? None of that. The most popular answer to why did you tick the Christian box was, well, I like to think of myself as a good person. <laughs> That's what we're up against. We're up against people who think that because they're a good person, they must be Christian. We're up against people who think you need religion in order to be good. And we're up against politicians who think that the majority of their voters won't vote for them unless they profess to be, to be religious. Maybe the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> Thank you. We'll go over here. Professor Dawkins, you refer to science as a great art, and I think many of us would agree that it is. But especially for us college students who were in high school not so long ago, we remember our classmates who saw science as just a bunch of numbers, musty textbooks, completely boring. How do we convince people that science is art, that the complexity is not irreducible in the sense to be boring, but irreducible because it's an, uh, an art, a great art form? Well, I, I tried to say something about that earlier on um, in, in answer to one of Jamila's questions. Um, and I'm not sure that I got much to, much to add, actually. I mean, I, I don't think science has to be a study of the Bunsen burner. Um, Clearly, it does have to be, we, it, we, in order to get actual research scientists, lab coat scientists, we do need people to, to learn the, the craft of laboratory science. But just as you can appreciate music, and indeed at a very deep level you can appreciate music, without ever having learned to play a note on any musical instrument, so you can appreciate science as art, like music, you can appreciate science, the beauty of science, without ever actually touching a Bunsen burner, uh, or, or without ever going into a, a scientific lab. And so we do, need, we do need scientists, of course we do, but everybody needs to, to learn to appreciate science, the Carl Sagan rather than the nonstick frying pan kind of science. Uh, and I think I've already said, said enough about that, probably. Go here, and then we'll just keep going down the line. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Road to Reason, and we remind you to tune in each week on Sundays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time on Fairfax Public Access and Ustream. Make sure to visit and like our Facebook page and to watch archived episodes on YouTube.